I bought my first million dollar mansion in Fresno, California. It's not that I'm the type that likes to show off with my means of living. It's more like I came from a background where I had less than nothing. And I would be damned if my own children would grow up in the same childhood that I had. So, needless to say, my developmental years were spent developing a strong sensitivity to who I allowed in my bubble and who I did not. This basically made me an adult who put up fences and had zero tolerance for anyone who didn't belong behind them. You step onto my property uninvited and there's gonna be fireworks. I landed this mansion and I made sure that security was a priority. I set up an entire network of cameras and I personally would monitor them from my phone. I had it set up so that I would get an alert every time there was movement. Needless to say, you could imagine my phone went off constantly. But I didn't pay much mind unless my phone was going off at hours of the day when it really shouldn't have been. Like in the dead of night, when my phone began going off and I got up and opened the app. The footage was indistinct but it looked like they were a pair of people that must have been wearing light-colored pants with dark clothes because their pants were all I could see. They must have also either been dragged or drunk. Their gait was rather swaying and staggering. From the moment I saw the footage, I immediately entered fight or flight, leaning heavy on the fight part. While they kept coming back, my phone kept going off around the same time every night. So, you know what? I decided it was time to catch them in person. The fact that they kept wearing light-colored pants and dark-colored tops made me wonder, could this be a local gang? They seemed to skirt at the edge of my pond, at the edge of my property. So that's where I waited for them. I had the line of a full moon with me, so I was able to see clearly if they still wore the same clothes as they did the last couple of times. Luckily, I didn't have to wait long. They showed up around the same time frame, a little bit after midnight. Sure enough, their pants were lighting up like bone gleaming in the moonlight. I practically jumped out of my lawn chair to go confront them, but I stopped short. I was heading under the shadow of a tree, so I doubt they saw me, but I got a really good clear look at them. I was only able to ever see their pants on camera because that's all there was. I know that sounds ridiculous, but there was nothing but a waist and a set of long legs and feet. There was no torso. I remember my throat constricting. I couldn't even yell. I immediately got to doing some sort of research, and it turned out that I saw these things that are referred to as Fresno Nightcrawlers. Apparently, they're a rare sight, but I guess I was lucky to host their nighttime activities. They would pass through my yard for the next three weeks before they were gone and never come back. I could not explain to you the chill that would come over me whenever my phone would go off a little bit after midnight. I knew what app it was, and I knew what it would show me if I pulled it up. They didn't look threatening, but they didn't appear friendly either. I thought it best to just avoid them. Anyway, I'm not really a scary story or paranormal guy, but I felt that my recent experiences were worth sharing. Thank you. My prized possession was a treehouse that my father had built me. It felt like a castle that set up on a grand old oak, and it was big enough to practically be a foundation for a smaller house, let alone a treehouse. It's not at the farthest corner of our yard, so I felt like I was the king of my own little empire, being able to see all of our yard and a great deal of what was beyond the fence. There was a lot of rolling prairie land with a tree line of vast forest at the very edge. The forest was so far away that it wasn't like I could just walk out of there, and that's beside the fact that it was not our property. My parents are really good at keeping me involved, they didn't like the idea of having an idle child, so I relished the moments that I can spend in the treehouse because that was pretty much my vacation from the garage of things that my parents set up for me to do. 
and I often spent that time sleeping. It was during one of those naps that I woke up to the sound of snuffling and sniffing. Not unlike the sound you'd expect from a dog, but it seemed too loud, especially since I could hear from the inside of the treehouse, and the source of it was outside, somewhere. Fear took hold of me when I turned around and looked out, out one of the windows of my treehouse, and then I saw a pair of eyes looking at me. They were set into a head that was vaguely human, except the head was upside down. Whoever it was, they were on top of my treehouse, hanging down, looking at me through the window. I could only see them from the bridge of the nose to the top of their bald head, eyes wide open, as they were full of mania or surprise. The eyes were wide open, and a pure white color. I took all these details in, in about one second, and then this thing quickly pulled back and disappeared. I could hear it scrambling on top of my treehouse roof, the movement sounding very frenzied and quick, with sudden halting between movements, almost as if it was moving around like a spider on the hunt. In those heartbeats of stillness, I heard a clicking sound. I then held my breath until I couldn't anymore and I was gasping for air, even though I was trying not to. I looked over to the door of my treehouse. I had left it open, and as quietly as I possibly could, I moved over and shut it. No sooner had the knob latched into place, and something on the other side grabbed hold of it, rattling it violently. I held on to it, and held it for dear life. The tug of war eventually stopped, and there's the sound of a little bit of me scrambling on top of the shuffling and chomping that went completely silent. Holding my position for what felt like hours, and my legs underneath me were beginning to go to sleep, but I didn't dare move a muscle. I then heard the sound of my dad's voice, calling out my name. I wanted so badly to answer him, but I felt like I couldn't. I didn't want to risk the possibility of drawing the attention of that thing or whoever was to me again. I only answered him when it sounded like he was right outside. He wasn't being attacked, so I reasoned that I wouldn't be either. I must have looked like I'd seen a ghost, because my dad's expression changed as soon as I got sight of him. He asked me what was wrong, and to my surprise I couldn't form a whole sentence. All I could do at the time was let out a strange, strained wheeze. I stayed that way, clear up until bedtime, when my parents were thinking of taking me to the ER. I broke down, told them what I saw, what I heard, and began crying. They simply just exchanged looks, but I couldn't tell if it was because they thought I was nuts, or because they knew something. They clearly didn't voice their thoughts either way. And after that, that pretty much killed my treehouse fun. I tried to make myself go in there and enjoy myself like I had before, but it just wasn't the same. I didn't feel safe anymore. I didn't feel in charge of my own safety. So, I just gave it up. This is going to be a bit long, but I'm seriously terrified and need help. I'll start off by saying I've never believed in anything paranormal. I'm a pretty science-based dude. I always look for a logical explanation, and I still am for this encounter. So if you have any ideas, I would love to know. I don't have much time for leisure with work recently. Been having to accept some pretty awful shifts to get away with COVID-19 times. I've lost my ability to go on my evening walks, which are a method of stress relief for me. It had been a while since I had gone on one, so three nights ago, I decided to just go for a late night walk, put on my headband flashlight, and decided to take a path that I had not in ages. There's actually a small trail near the back of my neighborhood that goes roughly four miles deep into the woods. My plan was to walk about a mile and a half and then take the parallel path to come back. 
I make it down to about 1.3, according to my Fitbit, and I start getting that feeling that I'm being watched. I turn off my headlight, sit, and listen. At this point, I'm more concerned there's a guy following me who is up to no good. I heard clear footsteps in the leaves off the trail, and they've been behind me nearly five minutes. I stopped thinking it was an animal or another walker and became worried. Sitting there for probably three to four minutes, and I hear nothing. I turned back on my headlight and decided to start walking quickly back home. About two minutes later, I hear more footsteps. But this time it sounds different. It sounded like four feet instead of two, and it's walking at the same increased speed that I am. I turn around quickly with my headlight and my phone light and point it behind me. Silence. I get angry and yell out, leave me alone. I'm going to call the cops. And if you come at me, I have a knife. More silence. I yell again to get the hell out of there and start walking towards where I heard the walking. About 20 yards out, which was hard to fully make out because the flashlight doesn't reach too far, I see what looks like a literal naked man running full speed on all fours into the woods. Normally, I'd chalk that up to drugs, but my area does not have a drug problem, and there were some details that led me to believe it was not a person. For one, they were damn near hairless. I'm talking completely bald, pale white skin, and the way it ran on all fours looked natural. Not like when you try to run on all fours and look stupid. It looked like its literal bone structure was designed that way. There were no hunched look. Their back was flat, and they were fast. The last thing that happened was straight out of a horror movie. I hadn't heard anything in a while while on my way back, but kept turning around just to be sure. With about 0.3 miles left to go until I was in the clear, I hear a mad dash through the leaves. I whip around and it stops on a dime. I see the edges of its head behind a tree and yell out loudly in an attempt to intimidate. What I heard next, I'll never forget. It cackled like a monkey a noise I've literally only heard in nature documentaries. The tone was that of a mockery, a predator having fun with me. Safe to say I didn't stick around. I sprinted as fast as possible back home. Listen, I would love to believe this was some sort of prank or some rabid, bald, diseased coyote, but I got a pretty clear look at it, and it wasn't human. It did have human feet and hands, a human head, and even a human buttocks. But nothing else about it was human. I called the cops after and told them a man was following me. I didn't want to say some creature because they think I was crazy. They didn't find anything, but they did see quite a bit of activity in the leaves and dirt, about 50 feet from where the trail was, leading far back into the woods before it got to a large stretch of grass where no footprints could be seen. Please tell me I'm crazy, or that this was some elaborate prank, or possibly a deformed man. I have done a ton of research after I had a very strange encounter whilst camping this one time. But, I can't find anything like what I saw. Similar, but not the same. So, I wonder if anybody listening to this might be able to help me. A few months back... I went on a camping trip with some good, close buddies of mine. Nothing too crazy, just some basic fresh air good times. On the second night, I woke up to use the bathroom. Since the bathroom block was a short walk away, and not only was it dark, it was also pouring down rain, I threw in a jacket and headed over to the trees. Since I didn't want to pee where you would likely be stepping later, even with the rain, I used my flashlight and headed just a bit further into the trees. We were also camping with some girls, and it just didn't feel right exposing myself so close to them. Just as I'd finished, 
I heard some rustling nearby, as it was your stereotypical dark and stormy night. I was in the middle of a wood, surrounded by all sorts of animals. After all, I wasn't exactly shocked to hear it, but at the same time, I didn't want to meet a squirrel with my pants down. Then, and I will swear this happened, I heard my name being called, but not from the direction of the tents, in front of me, in the trees. Now that freaked me out for sure, but my mind told me the most logical explanation was one of the others had also woken up and was messing with me. I called out, but not too loudly, and then it stepped out into my flash. It was taller than you'd expect an animal to be, but way shorter than I, so around four feet or so. It was covered in white hair or fur. It had legs similar to a goat, with cloven feet, but regular human-like arms that was also covered in thick, dark fur. The hands resembled that of a person. The head, I guess, was a bit like a goat, or maybe a deer. It was really strange looking, and it had these big white eyes. The thing had antlers on it too, but not huge. It just stood on two legs, and then this is the weirdest part, as if all this isn't weird enough. This thing had one more shocker to it. It spread its wings and rose up into the air, and I stood there in shock, staring at it, as it called my name again. But its mouth didn't move. It was almost like it was telepathic. And then in the blink of an eye, it disappeared. I just wandered off back to the tent, in a daze, in shock. I didn't sleep a wink, and as soon as it got light, I went back to that spot in the trees. In fact, part of me was sure I must have been sleepwalking, that it was some crazy dream. Just as I got to the tree that I had urinated on, I saw it, some black hair on the ground. It was real, but all the stuff and weird stories I've ever found, there's been nothing like this. Oh, and by the way, this happened in Central Oregon just for reference. I will never forget this thing that I saw once when I was out horseback riding. In the UK, we have plenty of brittle tracks which are specifically for horse to cut out some of the roads. I use these as often as possible when I can avoid all traffic as it tends to spook my mare. Sometimes we do go off paths and do a little bit of exploring. Nothing too rough on our legs and feet, but there is plenty of beauty to discover in the English countryside. There is also plenty of oddities as well as dangers. And although I consider myself an experienced writer and map reader, sometimes you can get a little lost by accident, which was what happened that day. I would have never taken the path so close to the caves and grottoes down by the river by choice, but somehow, that was where we ended up. Traffic spooks her, as I said, but not much else, so I was more mindful of keeping away from the rocky areas and banks by the river, because of her shoes than her being worried. As I was trying to work out a safe way to get us back up onto the road, I noticed sudden movement in one of the caverns. Now, being an animal person and living in the UK, there aren't too many animals to be wary of, especially when you're on the safety of horseback. I wasn't exactly afraid, not to start with at least. I was curious though, what could be in there? We don't have bears, and most of our forest life is in trees or burrows. I wish now that we had just kept on walking and ignored it because the thing that appeared in the cave opening was like nothing I have ever seen before or hope to ever see again. It was tall and thin, almost skeleton-like. It was a very strange color, like dirt, but then I suppose it could have literally been covered in dirt and filth. It had an almost human-like body, and for just a moment, I thought that it could have been a person who had been trapped in there. 
potentially starving, hence the very bony appearance and filthy skin. But there was no presuming it was a human once, because the head became fully visible. I tried my best in that moment not to scream, or to startle or scare my horse. The last thing I wanted was to be thrown off and left with this thing. The head. The only way I can describe it was that it was like a bird, and there was utterly no way it could be any kind of mask. It was far too realistic, especially the way the mouth or beak opened up, and the eyes were strange too, pale and cloudy, as if it were blind. This thing, whatever it was, was hideous, and it appeared to have something dripping out of its mouth, and that's when I noticed part of a rabbit in its hands. It was eating on a dead rabbit, this grotesque bird on an emaciated humanoid body. I just suddenly came to my senses, and we cantered off. I'm ashamed to say I was less concerned about my horse's hooves, and more for our lives. I haven't got a damn clue what that thing was, but there's a reason not to go messing around near caves. We wandered off, and this thing kept a close eye on us the entire way, until we were no longer visible. Luckily, it never made an attempt to leave the cave to come after us, nor did I ever feel like it wanted to. Perhaps it was just curious by our appearance. I'm not sure. Either way, it's by far one of the strangest things I've ever seen in my life. Sometimes, you see the weirdest stuff in the most regular of circumstances. Like this one time, I was literally just walking home from watching a game at my friend's house. It wasn't totally dark, but it was getting there. It's a fairly built up area though, and I'm a dude in my 30s, so I wasn't exactly worried. However, I ain't dumb either. So when I began to get the feeling that somebody might be following me, I quickly picked up my pace. It was that kind of feeling you get when you know somebody is staring at you, when you can feel their eyes all over you. There were plenty of houses about and cars traveling up and down the street. I figured it was unlikely that I'd get jumped with a ton of potential witnesses. I stopped near a parked car where a couple were just getting out and heading back into their home. Pretending to check my phone, and actually looking behind me to see if I could see anybody. But there was nobody. Figuring I must have been mistaken, I carried on walking. I still had that feeling of being watched, even though it felt like I was just being paranoid. I kept checking behind me, but there was nobody there. No shadowy figures. No meth heads. Nothing. It made me feel really uncomfortable if I had to say, and I would admit that there was something that just felt wrong. Foreboding, may I say, but there was no reason for it. Nobody was there. I must be losing it, I remembered thinking. There was nothing behind me. Then came the horror movie moment. As I turned looking in the direction to see if somebody was following behind me, I heard movement right in front of me. Of course, wouldn't you know it, it had to happen on the stretch in between the blocks of houses where the parks and greenery is for people to walk their dogs and kids to play. I turned around very slowly, ready to use my charm to talk this dude down or use some of that X-line backer strength I still had. Maybe expected to find some skinny kid in a hoodie. What I would have not have guessed in a million years was the boogeyman. Standing there, on the grass near the play park, was the biggest, blackest, nastiest looking thing I've ever seen. Its entire body was like oil, and when I say oil, I mean almost a translucent, liquidy black. I couldn't make out any features on the face, except two brightly glowing white eyes. It seemed alive. As I said, I played high school and football in college. I'm a pretty big guy, but this could have wiped me out. It was built real stocky, 
like a large slab of muscle. It was very devilish, and it instantly gave me a terrible feeling in my entire core. Then, I began to hear a low, rumbling noise. This thing was growling. I nearly fell to my knees in terror, and this thing approached me slowly, and then just appeared to dissipate into thin air, as if it was never there. I have questioned my sanity and my vision since this, wondering if I have had schizophrenic hallucinations, or if I'm just losing it. Either way, it was completely terrifying, and I cannot shake the feeling I had prior to this encounter, since it lasted for quite some time. That same feeling up until I saw it with my very own eyes, except when I saw it, the feelings were intensified. I truly believe I saw some sort of monster from hell stalking me. Why and what its purpose was, I'll never know exactly for sure. Could it have been a messenger? I don't know, or potentially, like the Native Americans believe, showing itself, revealing itself to be a bad omen of things to come. I don't want to know, nor do I want to find out. I never want to see that horrible thing again. Hiking, camping, and hunting are some of my very favorite things to do. I've had some pretty crazy experiences with animals, not behaving like they're supposed to. I've been chased by creatures that are supposedly meant to be docile, and even had a mountain lion walk straight past me. But the story I tell over and over is the time that I saw what I truly believe to be a Sasquatch. I was down in Utah and trying out some ultimate survival skills in order to run a course back home. I feel confident that I'm tough and can deal with most things you might experience out in the wild and know the places to stay the hell away from. I might be a survivalist, but I'm not going to intentionally put myself in the path of a mama bear or a hungry pack of wolves, even with my gun. So I don't go looking for trouble necessarily. I just teach how to survive if trouble finds you. And that day, I truly believe if I hadn't had my wits about me, I would have been Sasquatch dinner for sure. I was nearing the end of the session down there anyway, when I took a deep hike. I had my gun holstered on my belt, just in case. There was just wading through the undergrowth when I am hit by the most god-awful smell. It was terrible. I probably ain't no daisy myself, but this was terrible. Like a thousand skunks had all set off their stink and then died. You get the picture. I'm thinking I'm about to come across some rotting corpses, like a maggot-infested deer or something, but I can't spot anything on the ground. Then, the trees start shaking, and I could hear this noise. It was like a boom. There's either going to be an earthquake, or something massive is coming through the trees. Then I see it. It doesn't come too close, leaving itself some room. But it is massive, and partially hidden by the trees. But I could see this huge mass of what looked to be a body, very resembling of a bear or a gorilla. Then, something hit me. I look down, and it's a small rock. The more hit me, and I see this huge creature is pummeling me with rocks in my direction. And that was when I made the connection. Disgusting smells. Huge footsteps and a large body. Now the stone's being thrown at me. I've only ever heard of these kinds of things through tales. There's no doubting this was indeed a Bigfoot. Could I have possibly stumbled across its territory or gotten too close to its home? Unfortunately, I didn't get the chance to investigate further as it started throwing bigger and bigger rocks, and one nearly caught me in the face. I thought I'd get the hell out of there before it killed me. Interestingly enough, this being, whatever it was, assuming it was a Bigfoot, could have easily killed me while throwing rocks at me. But it wasn't. It was intentionally missing me, throwing small rocks, as if trying to get my attention to beat it. I truly wonder if it really wanted me out of there. And maybe, just maybe, 
it smelt me first, which is why it was drawn to me. One thing I know for sure now is that Bigfoots are real. When I was just a kid, we had a couple of cousins that lived way out in the countryside. They were full-on proper hillbillies, and that was for sure, but with hearts of gold, and I loved visiting them. We'd play for hours out in the woods back then, and we were actually allowed to be out all day or until our bellies rumbled for food. The woods were likely full of all sorts of dangerous stuff, but they were the kind of people that you thought you had to learn from your own mistakes and to not coddle the kids. It was great. Tree climbing, den building, swinging across the river. We'd come home covered in filth and bruises, and my aunt would always just say, did you guys have fun? We'd always tell them we did. So, the day we came running back to the house after having been only out for a couple of hours, tears streaking down our faces and more than down my youngest cousin's leg, they knew something must have happened. We told them that we were playing far in the woods, down by the old creek and the tire swing. And all of a sudden, we smelt this terrible smell and the first thing we did was blame each other. But it was a hundred times worse than even a fart could be. A rustling noise and brush. We turned and we saw it. Some sort of half man, half gorilla watching us. It made a scream. This thing was huge and it was looking at us high up in the trees. Its face was kind of like a monkey. It was really tall and covered in dark reddish hair. It opened its mouth and roared, and we all saw just how massive its teeth were. We ran. We were then told by my uncle, he and my older cousin Dale had grabbed their guns and headed back to that exact spot. When they came back, they hadn't found a thing, but the smell, that god-awful stench lingered, and there was also some footprints is what appeared. I swear, my uncle looked like he'd actually seen a ghost, pale. He said the footprints were huge, much larger than any of their shoe size, and my uncle is practically a size 13-14. He told his boys that we weren't allowed to go back, ever. In his opinion, we had seen ourselves a squatch. This story takes place when my grandfather was still very much alive. He was the kind of man that spent literally every waking hour of his life working as a rancher, squeezing every dime out of every last second of his time. It paid off. He was able to retire quite handsomely and get a comfortable house in the middle of 17 acres of forest. If that doesn't sound isolated, well, it was. He never did like people, and I was kind of lucky that he liked me. He was every bit of the old man's stereotype that shakes his fist and tells people to go away. More often than not, when he wanted to spend time with me, I ended up being his bouncer. Any stray sounds in the woods surrounding his home was an intruder, and I had to be the one to go on and tell them to get off. It always ended up being a squirrel or a falling branch or some other ridiculous, benign, non-human cause. He was kind of psychotic. So, I guess you could assume that by this point. But that didn't dissuade him one bit. If he heard it, he had to attack it. His successful retirement hadn't upgraded his diet by much. He still had me over for some stew right out of the can. And when we were eating, we had heard a sound that was on the level of thunder, only it wasn't coming from the sky. It couldn't have been. The skies being perfectly clear. I can vividly remember his face getting red and telling me to go chase the kids off his land. I believe that there was something to this this time, because whatever that sound was, it was deafening. I was pretty apprehensive in going out to take care of this problem all I had was a revolver that he had gifted me when I was 16. It was better than nothing, but still. I entered a clearing in the woods where I found the source of the clamor. 
I could scarcely believe my eyes, and it was kind of a miracle that I didn't mess myself on the spot. Nothing in all my years could have prepped me for what I saw. Ever heard of a Bigfoot? I mean, who hasn't by now? But have you ever heard of a snowy white albino Bigfoot? Maybe that's a little new, at least for me. Heard of a snowy white Bigfoot having a violent encounter with other wildlife. It might sound like something out of a novel, but that's what I was seeing. This thing was huge, like you'd expect, and for some reason, a group of timber wolves had decided to pick a fight, and this big white Bigfoot, assuming that's what it was, grabbed one wolf and tore it in half like it was nothing. The other one was grabbed and nearly choked to death. It was terrifying. I was horrified. But they weren't discouraged, and they kept attacking. Then, this thing grabbed a third wolf, and grabbed it by the legs, and slammed it up against the tree, nearly breaking its back, as if it were a dead rabbit. I ran, for fear of my own life and safety. Then, I had to tell my grandfather that there was this thing, a Bigfoot, wrecking several timber wolves. He reacted about the way you'd expect. His eyes got wide, and he waited for me to tell him more. But he might not have believed me right then and there. He called me a few years later to tell me that he saw a Bigfoot, a white one, that I told him about before. I know there are more terrifying things than a Bigfoot, but the entire experience and visual of it all left me with a sense of smallness. If wolves are nothing more than field mice in the eyes of some things on Earth, then what are mere men? I guess I shouldn't be so shaken up over seeing things in this new perspective, but I'd spent my life seeing men in a place in the universe that they apparently didn't really occupy. It's really done something to me. It's changed me, and not in a good way. This is hands down one of the scariest encounters I've ever seen in my life and it tells me that we are definitely not on top of the food chain anymore. While I was growing up, my best friend was a border collie. We named her Cindy. Cindy was as wild as you would expect the breed to be. And if you know anything about border collies, well, it shouldn't be a surprise. She was the usual black and white. And even though we didn't have any sheep, since they're amazing sheep herding dogs. She behaved every bit like a sheep dog toward me. I was the livestock that she had to keep corralled. So it was something of a game between her and I to just see how far I could get before her instincts kick in and she had to come collect me or whatever it was she was doing in her brain. At the time, we lived at the edge of an expansive pine forest deep in Nebraska there was no shortage of timber for us to roam around in. For obvious reasons, my parents preferred that I did not go into the woods by myself. I mean, I was only seven at the time. But as any parent of a child of seven years of age, children exist only to push whatever boundary is in front of them, much to the dismay of creatures like parents and even sheepdogs. If you're hearing this story, on a certain Cryptid Encounter podcast, then you know I have a story for you that didn't end well. It was one of those getaways that should not have happened. My parents were not around. Their friends were around, and so was Cindy. Plus, they had sternly charged me not to run off into the woods. So, with that many sets of eyes, I shouldn't have been able to get away undetected. Somehow I did, as soon as I sensed a window of opportunity, I booked it to see how far I could get before Cindy came looking. I had already long forgotten about the adults. I got a pretty good head start, and then I began to get lost. No adults and no dog came looking. I lost my bearings, and I couldn't find my way back at the time. So, I entered into a very small clearing where there was a small pond. I was enchanted to the point that I forgot about getting back. Something moved in the shadows of the trees, and that's when I was confronted 
by the biggest living thing I had ever seen or known in my life. It resembled a monkey, but was very manlike in appearance. I guess I used to call it a mountain monkey, if that makes sense. I wasn't entirely sure if I should be afraid or fascinated. The thing's face was a mixture of curiosity and puzzlement, and yet I could tell it seemed to be devoid of any friendliness. Just as it was reaching one hand, Cindy appeared, and she put herself between me and this giant monkey thing, and began barking like crazy, her hackles raised, and her teeth bared. This only fascinated this creature even more, or this monster, whatever it was. The creature just reached out toward its hand and tried to grab onto Cindy. But that's when I was truly terrified, because it somehow grabbed her and then choked her to death. And when I mean choked her, I don't mean in a traditional sense. It literally grabbed her and crushed her like she was a Coke can. That's when I panicked and fled, crying hysterically, screaming. I slammed into my father, who was completely livid. He wasn't sure if he should be happy to see me or be full of rage. After everything calmed down, the question was naturally raised as to the whereabouts of Cindy. At seven years of age, I tried to tell them as best I could, with my very limited vocabulary, that this giant monkey man killed her. But they wouldn't understand what I meant for a very long time. A lot of people say they have had a hard time shooting Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Whatever, when they see it, because it just looks far too human. I have a feeling that if I ever encountered it again, and I'm armed, I would have zero problems taking revenge and taking a shot right between the eyes. The sound of my dog struggling for its life while it was being crushed alive is now this vivid traumatic memory in my mind and will forever be. My parents, however, at the time were convinced I saw a bear that killed Cindy. How wrong they were. I'm a longtime listener of your show, and I've been trying to figure out where my story could fit in. You've got some pretty incredible accounts told here, and I've noticed that you especially favor dogmen. Well, I've decided to see how my story will go over with you, but it could go over like a lead balloon. I didn't have an experience with dogmen, as you describe them often. I did, however, encounter a wolf-like creature that makes your average timber wolf look like a rat. Some of my business brought me up to the unusually remote and desolate region between Canada and Alaska. I know, it sounds like a bizarre strange place to have any kind of business to attend, but hear me out. We were experiencing near total whiteout conditions, and it was catch-22. If we tried to bed down and ride out the night, we would surely freeze. If we continued on our way with the weather being what it was, there was no telling what kind of directionlessness we could end up in and waste our efforts and resources. We made a tentative effort to rest for a very, very short time. I had a shotgun at the ready. Even as remote as our location was, there were always bears to look out for, or so I'm told. Plus, we're also in one of those regions where legends tend to stick. Most of them you couldn't take too seriously, but others made you wonder. Stories about Bigfoot and things that were just a little too big to be a normal bear or a normal bird. Just one of those places that could easily be hiding, something we arrogantly assumed died out millions of years ago. Due to my heritage, I tend to buy more into the legends of the region, stemming from the days of the Native American tribes that used to occupy the present land. I was dozing off when a sound even louder than the snowstorm had reached me and jarred me awake violently. It sounded like a war zone, when in fact it was our truck being moved by something. And when I say moved, I mean being tossed around like a Hot Wheels toy. I could just barely make out what looked like a living mountain of fur that was being rapidly glazed up by the storm. 
The bad thing about detailed descriptions in a snowstorm is that the brain attempts to fill in the gaps of what it can't see for sure. That's how snow blindness occurs. It's essentially sensory deprivation to the point where the brain creates light hallucinations to compensate. In the moment, I was pretty sure that this behemoth of fur had very small ears that were tucking themselves into the monstrous broad head they were attached to. The forehead reminded me of a pit bull. That's where all the other similarities to anything else disappeared. It attempted to look like a wolf trying to be a bear. I know, bizarre, and not as thrilling as dogmen. It wasn't appearing to walk on hind legs, and no, it did not have glowing red eyes. But it possessed a fierce primal rage, and its eyes were visible without a light. I caught its gaze just long enough for it to redirect the anger from the truck over to us. Acting sooner than thinking, I raised the shotgun and let it have both barrels. The sheer size of the monster, as it reared back on its hind legs, still not like a dogman, made the shotgun feel so ineffective. The thing's head was nearly giant. It swatted at the air, as if that would deflect the buckshot. I reloaded with shaky hands, firing off two more rounds. I must have done this several times, because the snow was starting to turn bloody. This monstrous bear-wolf thing took off, not dying, but very much unnerved. That's when we made the decision to keep moving right then and there. Adrenaline and pure terror scouring my veins kept me warm for the time being. It also kept me alert, awake, and most importantly, alive. It's one thing to encounter a monster that you've never seen before. It's another to meet that monster entire leagues away from other people, other than your traveling buddies who are just as puny and clueless as you. Like I said, I did not encounter a dogman, but this was still a terrifying experience for me. I wish you could see the way I'm shaking as I relive these moments. I love your show, and I'll be listening, and I thought it was important that I added my two cents and my own story. To conclude, no, this was not a grizzly bear. Even though it possessed the same size if not larger, it looked vastly different. It looked more like a wolf combined with a bear, if that makes any sense, and had this unnatural viciousness to it. That's the best I can describe. I found myself in a valley, an exceptionally isolated and wild region of Canada. This valley is accessible only by boat or float plane, if that says anything about just how formidable the wilderness is. It does have plenty of springs and geysers, so the valley is almost consistently shrouded in mist. I'm telling you this because it tells you how crazy I was to be dragged out here. I was desperate for money, and the person I was working for was desperate for support. I agreed to a healthy paycheck if I managed to survive. The valley is often referred to as Headless Valley, if that tells you anything. Almost all the bodies that turn up in the place have suffered decapitation. My employer had a crew of about 13 total, including him. A few were like me in it for the money. The rest were full-blown monster-loving psychos. And for the sake of the story, I'll refer to my employer as John Alpha, just to keep his identity safe. Mr. Alpha planned on having a seance on her very first night, being a very quote-unquote spiritual individual. A heavy rain had him cancel that plan, which was more than fine by me, since I'm a pretty firm atheist but I'm not a strict materialist either. There was something about that valley that I felt a weird feeling. At least we weren't going to freeze. I was surprised at how comfortable the valley was compared to the rest of the wild, thanks in part to the springs. I could see how animals and the rest of the world couldn't sustain down here, at least as far as hiding goes. 
Mr. Alpha enthusiastically explained that we were going to set up a mobile production studio in a tent. I suddenly had the feeling of being exposed. No more protection from the evil of the valley than the men that had passed through during their age of gold. I was assigned to go do reconnaissance on the area with a co-worker that I'll call John Beta. Again, these aren't real names. I'm just using these to protect the identities of the individuals I had this encounter with. Bear with me. All we got for the job were GoPro cameras and ghost detecting equipment. I swear, this stuff looked like it was made for movie sets rather than serious paranormal investigation. We began our hike in thick birch wood. We felt that the white bark would make other things easier to see. Also, it felt way too open and exposed if we had decided to stake out in the open. The woods is where all kinds of quote-unquote scary stuff happens. But you would have had to been there to know that feeling that I'm specifically describing. John Beta seemed much calmer than me, and he pointed out how high-strung I was, and that I should afford to relax. I, in turn, pointed out how every dead body that was ever recovered from this valley was decapitated, and that if he didn't believe me, he could simply Google it himself. He didn't. He shook his head. The ghost hunting equipment registered nothing as far as EVPs, and I didn't expect them to either. I tried not to think of all the ways that the valley earned its reputation of being legitimately haunted wilderness. I felt the need to relieve myself, so I ducked down into a natural pit that was lined with grass. I came out just in time to see something that looked equal parts prehistoric and demonic rushing up to my boss. It took his head off with one clean blow. To say that this was massive doesn't do it justice. He clearly didn't see it coming, due to the fact that it was a perfect shade of white to blend in with the surrounding, and the way it had moved with perfect silence was disturbing and chilling. The only detectable noise being was the disgusting sound of his snapping vertebrae. I have never felt that kind of raw, blind terror before in my life. This animal could have easily passed as a massive white wolf, but it was too broad. There were too many features that didn't quite fit. Tiny ears, tiny eyes, a strange long muscly tail sweeping behind it. The head was very large, broad and flat, like a smooth stone you'd find in a riverbed. The creature was busy tearing the flesh off this body. That was the first instance of things going wrong that could be followed by many more. I swore up and down that it was due to the valley being haunted, but Alpha agreed that we would be getting results of the ghost hunting equipment. He was just smart enough to pack us up and leave at the end of all of it before we would be utterly stranded. Listen, I feel like some of the evil energy of that valley has followed me home and I have to talk about it with somebody. That's why I feel I need to reach out. Maybe my story will serve as a warning that there are some places you should just avoid poking around in. Now, as far as that animal is concerned, I don't know what it was, but I'm glad we survived. I received a gift from my uncle that ultimately came as a surprise to put it mildly, the guy didn't like me. He never had. Even when I was a child. It's one of those enduring family mysteries that never really had any real explanation. It just simply was. When I was well into my adult years, he was a declining old man. He had sent me a letter. The first one, in fact, I'd ever gotten from him. He was sending me the deed to a plot of land in a forest located deep in Canada, of all places, and supposedly came with the cabin he had hand-built. I looked it over and made some phone calls to make sure it wasn't fake or a hoax. It appeared to be the real deal. I, being immediately suspicious, was this a trap? Not unless he had hired a gang of bandits to hang out. Maybe he felt bad for me. That was sorely unlikely, but it was the only piece that fit. 
It took me a while to get everything together, but I finally flew out there. It was indeed remote, and he wasn't wrong. It wasn't just situated inside a forest. It was practically swallowed by a forest. I mean, you could easily lose track of how light or dark it was, just because of how dense the woods were. But it was peaceful. It was time to check out the cabin itself, and it may as well have been condemned. But the land was good. I was going to step outside to enjoy some more fresh air, when I looked out one of the broken windows, and I froze in place. At first, I saw the bear. It was a black bear, and it was looking straight at me. But here's where it gets weird. There wasn't something quite right about it. The eyes did not look focused, and the head seemed to kind of have a limp. Two seconds later, I saw the monster that was gripping the black bear in its jaws. I couldn't have told you what it was, but I could tell you that it was enormous, as if a bear and a wolf had begotten offspring together. The bear was dead, and I could not run outside without being seen. I watched as this monster tore this animal in pieces like it was nothing. I was a prisoner for what felt like hours as this large animal ate far larger than the bear had killed. It's almost as if by some act of God, the thing left. I fled, exhausted from terror, standing there, waiting for the thing to pick up my scent and come after me next. The flimsy front of the cabin wouldn't have even held up if this thing wanted me badly enough. No, I have not contacted my uncle yet to let him know that I survived. However, if I see him again, I'm probably going to let him know what happened. If you're a hiker, a camper, or any sort of outdoor nature enthusiast, there will be certain safety drills what you will have practiced over and over. Everybody knows this. You will know and be educated on what animals to look out for, which plants to avoid. You will recognize danger before it ever happens. And if in the worst case scenario, something goes wrong, you will not only know exactly what to do, but you will have all the necessary equipment. At least this is what I had always thought. I have been outdoorsy my whole life. I would definitely consider myself an expert in all manner of nature and outdoors. I thought or assumed that I would be prepared for anything, not in a vain way. But if I came across a cougar or a bear, I'd like to think I would know what to do in order to survive, but I wouldn't start trying to wrestle it to the ground. It's important to know your limitations. Be very aware and safe. I know the correct course of action for almost any animal encounter, except for the thing I'm about to tell you about. It had been very wet, and I almost gave up the idea of a hike that I'd planned. I always wear long tops, tucking my pants into my boots and covering myself in bug spray. Besides, mosquitoes love a good feast, so you need to be careful. And of course, they love hot, damp, humid weather, even more so after a storm. I had planned this particular hike for ages and needed to be there at a certain time to take a photo of a very specific plant, which should be in bloom at the time. Against my better judgment, I went. Again, proving you shouldn't always listen to your instincts. But that day, I didn't. I was about halfway through the hike, and very close to where this particular plant should be, when I heard a loud buzzing. I was already smothered in spray, and was very liberally reapplying every half hour or so. I swear, you must have been able to smell the plants for miles around. I was aware of the buzzing, but pretty confident at the point that nothing would want to come near me. There shouldn't be any bees, wasps, or hornets around me, and most other bugs would be as intended, repelled by me. The closer I got to the spot where this plant should be, the louder the buzzing and flapping appeared. I could even feel a slight breeze. As I parted the branches, 
I very suddenly became aware what was making the buzzing. If you can imagine there being a giant bug, the size of a small human, standing, then maybe you would have ever seen the fly. If you can imagine there was a giant bug, the size of a small adult, standing there, on two legs, very reminiscent of the movie The Fly. If I had to guess, I'd say about five feet tall. It had a long, thin body, with bendy legs, very similar to that of a grasshopper, but also very humanoid looking. It had long wings which were constantly moving, and the fact that it stood on two legs was terrifying. Its head kind of reminded me of an ant or a grasshopper, very bugged out, no pun intended. It was also black and bright green. It looked more alien-like, to be honest, than it did a giant insect. It didn't quite seem to notice me, so I very, very slowly let the branches fall back in place and turn around as carefully as I could, creeping very quiet for a minute or two so I could be sure it hadn't heard or even sensed me. And then I ran with everything that I am. The most annoying thing about it now is that I had my camera in my hand to take a photo. But then, if I had taken the picture, would it have possibly noticed me and even pursued coming after me? I guess that's a question I'll never know the answer to. I worked security at a department store in Detroit. This was back before all the craziness and the riots, even before COVID. It was one of the roughest places to run a business, so my job involved checking outside as much as in, and there were always weirdos and drifters about, but rarely did I ever see anybody that looked like they were going to try and get inside. I had been lulled into a false sense of security. Since my job and my life revolved around the inner city, I never planned on seeing anything too outlandish, besides druggies and muggers. I mean, I never planned on showing up to work and suddenly being mauled by a lion. You expect that threats in the world will fit inside a very predictable bubble. Making my regular rounds one night, I stepped outside to do my usual, check for any prowlers or drug deals potentially going on. Well, more so prowlers. It was all clear, except for the door that opened into a narrow alley and it was pretty narrow. There wasn't room for more than two people to walk beside each other, let alone room for a car. It was a little bit thinner than a single lane, I guess. The light of the street lamp got in just far enough to light up the feet of two people that must have been standing face to face. Then there was a soft wet sound, like they were kissing it up. They were in shadows from the knees up, and they were just a little too close to the door for comfort. I lit up my flashlight and trained it on them. I was about to tell them to move when I saw that they weren't indeed kissing. One of them was eating the face off the other, holding them firmly in place when the light got the attacker's attention. It turned to me, and I wish it hadn't. It wasn't even remotely human. It had wicked-looking mouth parts, something like mandibles. The eyes were black and large. I didn't get to steady it for but a second since I screamed and fell backwards. I don't know why it didn't turn on me. As soon as I could think straight, I got to looking stuff up. Turns out there was a so-called mantis man that had been sighted around New Jersey, but it was never reported really on much. I was reminded of the incident involving bath salts in Miami, and I considered the possibility that I somehow imagined the inhuman features of the one person since their face was smeared with blood. I'm at a dead end for rational explanations, and I'm also at my wit's end for my mental health. That was a very brief encounter, but I'm still pretty shaken up over it. If I approached a counselor, they'd probably have me committed. So who can I talk to and tell my story to? 
so I'll possibly pass this on to you. Maybe you can help me. Most of the stories I hear are things about Bigfoot, or ghosts, or something like that. Well, I saw something driving home one night that is even scarier than Bigfoot. Mainly because I have never liked bugs. They're disgusting. I don't think that I'm afraid as such. I will happily squish one. They just gross me out. Anyway, I'm not here to talk to you about my innate disgust of bugs. I want to tell you what I saw. I was driving home one evening. It was late in the summertime, and although beginning to get dark, not totally yet. In fact, that's one of the things I do love about summertime, is it stays bright out till at least 9 or 10 p.m. So I was totally minding my own business when I heard a thumping sound from the roof. I wasn't driving too fast, so maybe it was a bird, but I'm not sure. Whatever it was, was still up there, on my roof as I'm driving. I thought, what the hell? I picked up speed. Now I'm in two minds about what to do. Should I stop, halt the brakes and hope it flies off? What if it hurts? Or should I just carry on and ignore it, hoping it solves itself? That's when I started to hear this loud buzzing. It must have been loud because I could hear it over the car engine. A buzzing and banging noise accompanied together. Now, I was starting to get pretty worried. It made one final bang, and then I catch a glimpse out the windshield, something flying off. This thing was humongous. It reminded me of a dragonfly, or a grasshopper, or a praying mantis, but it looked wrong. Not only was it incredible size, but it looked too much like a person. And instead of being green or black, or whatever color insects are, it was pale white. Kind of like an albino insect. Or so is what I got out of it. I floored it, never having driven home faster. When I got home, I frantically checked the top of my car, covered in all these weird scratches and this bizarre light green goop. It had a weird stench to it too. I just washed it off right away. And so far since then, I have never seen this creature or insect, whatever it could have been. Thank God. I was walking home from a very heavy night of drinking. I live in downtown Chicago it probably wasn't a very smart thing for me to do, walking alone, intoxicated. But hey, I was at the point of being drunk that every single place I passed looked like it could have been my house. I knew that wasn't good, but I was too drunk to care. It was a very still night, and it was so late that there was barely anybody else on the sidewalk. I felt a breeze that should have raised some alarms in my head, since it appeared to have a rhythm to it. It wasn't just a steady stream or whoosh of air. It was kind of a whoomp, 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 whoomp kind of sound, rather than a solid breeze. I just happened to look up and see something that literally sobered me up any quicker than a cop pulling me up and trying to arrest me. Something with the shape of a large man with wings appeared to be hovering in the air, nearly 20 to 30 feet above my head. Being dark, I wasn't able to discern every feature, and somehow, in my intoxicated haze, the details of this thing stuck out to me clearly. I made out large red eyes, no pupils, and a dark, very weird body. I could tell it was training its gaze on me. I felt this deep fear inside the core of my body, it was danger. I felt, had I stayed there, I would have died. I ran as fast as I could, screaming. This thing keeping pace with me overhead, without a problem, I ended up running into a tree, knocking myself unconscious, and nearly getting a concussion from it. I woke up, 
and was still in front of the tree. But I was by myself and luckily didn't have any serious injuries. It began tickling into the news that the supposed Mothman had been sighted in Chicago, a long way away from its usual home of the southern states. Now, I don't know much homework you do about the Mothman, but I want you to know that there have been numerous accounts and sightings of the Mothman being over the Chicago, Illinois area. I don't know if that's what I saw. I don't know if that has anything to do with what I saw, but I know I want nothing to do with what I saw that night. And just to clear things up, even though I was intoxicated, I am 100% behind what I saw. There is no backing down. I wasn't too drunk. I know for a fact that I saw this thing and I felt it. There's no way to explain looking at this thing and sobering up so quickly. It is one of the things that has terrified me to my very core. I never want to feel that again. So, my grandmother used to tell us this super scary story, which honestly, I don't even know if she wanted to frighten us to death, but it sure worked. She had grown up as a young child in some remote village in Indonesia, moving to the States in her later teens. There was a legend in her village that naughty children who disobeyed their parents would be taken away by a winged creature in the middle of the night. I don't know about you, but if I thought staying on Santa's good list wasn't reason enough to not misbehave, then the fear of being plucked out of your bed as you slept would sure do it. Apparently, according to my grandmother, she once saw the creature soaring past her window in the middle of the night. She has been quite poorly and unable to sleep, so her mother had her moved her bed over closer to the window so she could have some fresh air and enjoy looking up at the moon and the stars at night. Being a fairly small and poor village, there had been a bit of a scandal when one of the farmers allegedly told that somebody was stealing his fruit. Nobody truly admitted to the crime, and it seemed they had a thief in their midst. That same night, as grandmother was looking out the window, she saw the child stealer as they had named the creature. It was around the size of an adult human, but its skin was a bright color and completely hairless. It had two huge black wings and a face that was reminiscent of a rodent with two huge pointy ears. It gave the appearance of a half-human, half-bat-like creature. She said it made this horrendous high-pitched scream and entered the open window of the home opposite. Too frightened to see what happened next, she tells me she huddled down under her own covers, having closed her window quietly. Although she knew that she hadn't been naughty, there was no way that she wanted to be spotted by this thing. And of course, the next morning, there was utter panic in the village, as the small boy from the house opposite of her had been taken, vanished, with just a pile of stolen, rotting fruit under his bed. It scared her enough to go through her entire life as a law-abiding citizen, and she installed the same sense of moral code onto my own mother, and then onto us. This story alone was enough to keep my siblings and I out of trouble as kids, even though we were in the U.S. There was no way in hell we were risking the wrath of the child stealer, it might be an old Indonesian tale, but it's something that has stuck with me, even now as an adult. Currently, I am a nighttime security guard at a mall. For the most part, it's a pretty easy job. We don't tend to get a lot of trouble, and to be honest with you, it's mostly just a matter of patrolling through the building, making sure no would-be shoplifters have hidden themselves away and to be on site when late or very early deliveries come in. Piece of cake. It's fairly new, so there's no creepy stories that can go along with it, unfortunately. However, we do have some high-end stores, but nothing worth holding up, and all the money gets banked every night. We've never had any major raids or robberies. 
which is why when the alarm system started going nuts one night, over by the sporting goods area, I wasn't too concerned. Sometimes, not often, but it does happen, a raccoon or some other small animal gets into the delivery bay and sets off the motion sensors. That's about the scariest thing I had come across so far, as that thing was pretty big. However, it just ran out, and I opened the back up, having found no trash to rifle through. So I was expecting the same kind of deal this time. Headed over, coffee in hand, and how worried I was. I turned off the alarms and entered into the store. At first, when I heard the fluttering, I thought crap. A bird might be harder to scare off initially than a raccoon who just ran out. A bird will usually be a lot more scared and start making a mess of things. Once I got into the back where all the deliveries are sorted, the flapping got louder. And then I heard a sound that almost made me drop my coffee. It was this terrible, unhuman, ungodly shrieking noise. Again, I wasn't quite frightened, yes. I was startled, as I was expecting a bird noise, not that. But at this point, I wasn't what I would call scared. At least not yet. I hit the lights, still fully expected to be face to face with, I don't know, maybe a large owl or a pigeon. What I instead saw actually did make me drop my coffee and break my mug, reaching for my gun out of reflex. This thing was no bird. It was actually around the size of a large child, maybe a 10-12 to 12 year old child to be exact, completely black. If it hadn't been flapping about, I would have sworn it was a very small would-be robber. The body was very human, except its flesh was jet black and had very human-like arms and legs. But the head and the wings. Yes, this thing had wings. It was very reminiscent of a bat. It had tiny yellow beady eyes. Very pointy ears. Think like an elf, except longer. Very exaggerated and pointed. And very sharp looking teeth. Like little knives. Honest to God, it was some sort of bat human creature. It made this awful screaming noise, and at that point, in my fight or flight, I had two options. The first would be to shoot it. The second, open the delivery door back up. And you know what? I'm not a murderer, even if this thing was some kind of monster. You see, it wasn't trying to attack me. The scream seemed more like it was panicked, probably because it was trapped and it was right over by the door. So I released it, and the door opened up, and it flew straight out. After all that, it truly scared the hell out of me. I have no idea what the hell that was, what kind of animal it was, or what it was doing, or how it got in there. But I can confidently say, I never felt like it wanted to attack me, or try and hurt me. Even though it looked pretty vicious, and evil, and like it could have torn me in pieces. I just think it was maybe scared. I don't know. It still boggles my mind to this day. One thing I never did was actually get to see the security footage of it. I'm sure it's lying around somewhere. I like to take a run in the morning before heading off to work, since I am currently a teacher. This means getting up super early, and often when it is still pretty dark. Luckily, most of the tracks and streets around here are fairly well lit, even through the parkland, so it's not often I find myself running in total darkness. One winter morning, however, I desperately needed to get a stretch in before a long day ahead of teaching and Christmas pageant rehearsals. So, I was up even earlier than usual, and it was pretty dark out, despite the streetlights. I see all sorts of wildlife on my runs and have been scared to death many a time by something running across my path. But I am in their domain, 
when it is still officially nighttime, so I only have myself to blame, I guess. There are no predators here, though. I am not foolish enough to go running alongside bears or even mountain lions. To be honest, the biggest thing I have ever run across is a possum. They can be sneaky little guys, but again, never bothered me. More like, hey, get out of here. But on this day, something felt weird from that moment I got onto the path. So you know, there's about half a mile through the trees, which isn't really lit, until you get back onto the track. This is due to the tall timber. It kind of blocks in a lot of light, especially the angle in which the sun rises. I have ran it so many times I am confident anyway, but I always have the light on my phone too. On this morning, it was as if I could just tell as soon as I hit the trees that something wasn't going to happen, but I would never have expected to be what actually happened. I could hear commotion overhead, up in the top of the trees that I ran past. Now, there are often birds about to start their day, and squirrels even angry with me, quote-unquote, waking them up. It made me not so concerned. But whatever was going on did seem to be reaching some sort of crescendo. There was a ton of racket. And then, almost like something out of a cartoon, there was a whooshing noise, and in front of me stood what I can only describe to you as a Batman, literally. I mean, obviously it wasn't Batman, and for just a split second, bearing in mind that he was only illuminated by my cell phone light, I thought it was some loon dressed up as Batman, thinking it was a little early for Halloween. That freaked me out, as I thought maybe I was about to be robbed, when instead of asking me for my wallet, it made this weird high-pitched screaming, spreading its wings. I distinctly remember this. If this is a dude in a costume, he must know somebody in Hollywood, because that thing is super realistic looking. Black and scaly, yellow eyes, sharp little teeth. My mind began to try and compute that this thing in front of me couldn't possibly be a person in cosplay. The body was a weird dark red color, and it was not quite as tall as me. It had human-like arms and legs, but now looking at the face more and more, it was part man and part bat. It couldn't have been a mask. It was too realistic. It made that awful screeching hiss again and began to flap its wings. It shot up so fast that I didn't even see the direction that it went off in. I hadn't even really looked closely at its feet when I shone the phone light down to where it had been. There were claw marks, it appeared to have some sort of talons. It looked strong enough to pick up a small dog, possibly, and carry it away. I ran home, possibly racing as fast as I could. Later on, I found myself running on alternate routes and never went back on the same route. Now, and ever since then, I only run once the sun has risen. It's an encounter that will stay with me for a long time. Unfortunately, there's only few people I can tell, because, well, due to the nature of the story, who's going to believe me? Thank you for listening. Hi, just wanted to chime in and say I'm a huge fan of the show, and I wanted to send to you a report of my own. I was driving home one night, late after work. A little FYI on me. I work in a hotel what they call the evening shift or second shift, which means I finish up right about 2 a.m. or as soon as my coworker gets there, which sometimes isn't until 2.15. Since the roads are usually packed in the daytime, it is a quite built-up area, but at 2 a.m., I finally have the place to myself. It's a fairly short commute, so I was really only around 10 minutes from home and bed when something caught my eye out of the window. Just because I'm the only car on the road at the time doesn't mean I drive recklessly. You gotta go careful at night. 
especially considering I've had deer jump out in front of my car. So, when I saw something fly into the trash cans, something that looked huge, I made an effort to slow down, drive past and get a look. I will never forget what stepped out. It was around the size of a small teenager, maybe a large child, a middle schooler maybe, covered in thick black fur, it appeared, and large claws and talons. It was the weirdest looking thing I'd ever seen. It appeared to have a snout and reddish amber glowing eyes. I didn't see any teeth, but it had behind it the shape that appeared to be these massive wings. They looked exactly like a bat's, except more tattered. It was like I was looking at a gorilla with the head of a dog almost and bat-like wings. It's not a super accurate description, but it's the best one I can muster up. What I can't accurately tell you is this thing was incredibly ugly. I don't know what kind of animal it was, but it almost reminded me of a creature you'd see off the movie Army of Darkness. If you've never seen that movie, well, I strongly suggest you watch The Evil Dead, because they are good films. Anyway, I craned on and sort of went, and it disappeared. Anyway, I wanted to know if you've ever received ports of anything similar. Again, I've never seen something like that in my life, and although I do enjoy good horror stories, I had no intention to actually live in one so you can imagine how scared out of my life I am. This encounter took place when I was 14, and I had made friends with a fellow gun nut in school. He invited me over to his house to show me his parents' collection of rifles. Eventually, I would have him over to see my own dad's collection, but I think they were having much more firepower than my family was. It was when we were driving by a rather bare patch of land, I spotted a very attractive girl. She stopped me in mid-sentence, and even though we were cruising, she looked right back at me. I didn't say anything since we were with my friend's parents. I didn't want them to think that I'd turn their son girl crazy. We'd reached their home that sat at the edge of town, and it had a clear view of the Arizona rules. Then, we started looking through his parents' guns, and I began looking around the room. Hanging on the wall was the picture of the girl that I had saw while we were in the car. It was unmistakable. The exact girl. The eyes, mouth, hair. Especially the eyes were all the same. I almost yelped. If she was family, I was hoping that I would have the chance to meet her. I kept quiet until I could talk to my friend in private. When later on, we were poking around his backyard, I brought up the girl that I had seen and how she happened to look like the one in the pictures that he had hanging up on his wall. He met my sentence with a very confused look, but then relaxation. He made sure of exactly where and when I had seen the girl. I told him. It was enthusiasm that he didn't share. He was about to run to get his parents when he paused and thought better of it. He actually went and made sure his parents were distracted. They were both busy watching TV. He had me follow him. We began walking down the road when he pointed to a spot in the distance and asked me if that was where I had seen the girl. I nodded. How had he known? We turned off the road and began huffing through unmarked grassland until we came to a small rundown shed, almost a hut that had a strong box hidden underneath the floorboards. Right in front of me, my friend showed me a rifle with a scope. My pulse I could feel was quickening. I was confused and asked him what he was doing. He told me that his sister had gone missing one night, nearly two years ago. She was 13 at the time. He was 12. They shared a bedroom, and she had woken up, thinking she had heard the voice of her dead grandfather coming from outside. She was ecstatic 
and rushed outside and was gone in an instant, vanished without a trace. From where we stood, I could see the girl coming towards us in the distance. I asked him if that was his sister, but he refused to answer me. He was almost in a trance. Before I could do or say anything, he trained the rifle and fired. I was horrified as the shot landed and the girl fell to the ground. But then there she was again. Then there were two of her. My friend shot at both of them when his sister stopped appearing. He looked at me with a very sad expression. He told me that his parents wouldn't tell him exactly what they were, except that they always occupied the appearance and voice of the last person they supposedly killed. And they liked to hang around in burial places. The plot of land where I first saw her was a cemetery that had been in my friend's family for generations. They don't move on the house often, but when they did, they always looked like his sister when she was 13. She would have been 15 at the time if she were still alive. I wondered why he was being so open with me. Maybe he felt alien with all the weirdness of it and just needed somebody to share his encounters with. It wasn't like I was going to be able to run to law enforcement and tell them that this family was murdering their daughter over and over again. Anyway, we stayed close friends for a while, but I feared that one day I would hear his voice calling me from a place I normally wouldn't see him. Well, that never happened, but the chance of it never left my mind. This still stands out in my adult mind as one of the creepiest, eeriest, bizarrest things I've ever experienced, and just proves to me there are far more paranormal and supernatural things going on in this world than we can ever truly comprehend. I used to be a caseworker with CPS. This system ended up taking in custody of a child who was severely disturbed, both schizophrenic and prone to a wide variety of anxiety disorders. So to say that the child had his hands full would be putting it lightly. His parents had simply vanished and somebody reported that they hadn't seen any adults around the house for a very long time. The boy didn't have much to say about it, but he eventually told workers that he had murdered his parents. He was only nine, and I didn't think this likely, considering the mental challenges he had to cope with. Police did investigate, and found zero evidence of any foul play. There were a few signs of domestic struggling, but it was the kind that would have taken place between two adults, not adults and a child. I ended up growing attached to the boy just because of how distressed he was and how unusual the case was. We usually get children because the parents harm the kids, not the other way around. I wasn't privy to the more sensitive details, such as how he supposedly killed his parents, and it drove me crazy. I just wanted to help as much I could, but it was out of my jurisdiction. On an ordinary day, a man and woman showed up at the same time to take the boy. They claimed to be his parents, and they even had all the evidence to prove it. They had his birth certificate, photos, everything that you'd expect parents to have. They said that the sitter they hired had dropped everything and ran out on them while they were abroad. That's when the phone call to CPS was made. All their information checked out perfectly. The only problem was the boy himself. He was terrified of his parents. He wanted nothing to do with them, and he nearly went into convulsions of self-preservation. He would scream that they weren't his real parents, and that it was a trick. They were visibly hurt by this, but also understanding since their son was mentally ill to a severe degree. As much as he fought it, he had to leave. Something about it all didn't sit right with me, and in the mess of getting the boy out the door with his supposedly real parents, his case file had been left pulled up. The child's statement was that he had let something out of the basement that supposedly killed his parents 
and began looking and acting like them. He just managed to lock them back down in the basement during a supposed cat and mouse session. He had to endure the sound of his parents calling for him from the basement for days. Then the phone call was made and our people came to get him. It sounded like the talk of a mentally ill person to me, but when I went to follow up on the well-being of the boy months later, both he and his parents had vanished entirely without a single trace. Nobody heard from them, saw them, and it's left a chill in my bones that has never left. To this day, many years later, I still have no idea what came from them. I got out of that because it was too emotionally strenuous. I now have a completely different career path, and I don't look back. This was one of the most bizarre and chilling cases I've ever worked with. Of course, being in CPS, you deal with a lot of heinous things, but this tops it. Back when I was only 16, I was walking home from school, in high school. I lived in a small rural town at the time, in Indiana. The kind of place where you can afford to feel safe. My only real trouble at the time was bullies. So I made it a point to hang back until nobody was really around before I would walk home. My attackers didn't have the patience to hang around forever. I had been doing this for weeks when I noticed a very large, very strangely marked owl that followed me home. I watched it from the corner of my eye. It would usually just hop from tree to tree, hanging just far enough behind me. If I turned to look at it, it would fly away or sometimes freeze up. But as long as I didn't look at it directly, it would shadow me. I didn't really think anything of this until one week when my parents would both be away and I would be alone for seven straight days. It sounded fine to me at the time, and it wasn't like I was going to get kidnapped. The first day that I would be alone, I was walking home, and my owl friend was behind me. I was somehow comforted by the animal's presence. It looked like any other barn owl, just that its size and markings were very, very wrong. I tried to find comfort, even in the weirdness. Just as I was heading back into my yard, though, I saw the owl land in one of the many trees. I, at the time, pretended not to see it. When it looked like it was going to head on in, the owl fluttered to the ground, even though I was looking at it from behind several trees. This is where it gets really, really weird. Now bear with me. I swear, it transformed into a human shape that was a coal gray. It appeared to move with incredible speed to the corner of our house, where it could peer at me from around it. I thought I was hallucinating and losing my mind. I could hear my heartbeat pounding in my head. But there it was, still as a statue, staring, waiting for me to do something. I had worked up just enough courage to hurry through the front door and tightly lock it. Instantaneously, somebody on the other side had tried the knob and then knocked gently. I looked at the people, thinking somebody must have been waiting playing a prank, but I couldn't see anything. As soon as I walked away from the door, there was more knocking, and it was much harder and urgent sounding this time. So, I quietly tiptoed to the front door and looked through the hole again. This time, I saw the face of our local mailman, which was ridiculous. Mail was delivered in the morning, around here, not 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I felt almost incapable of leaving the house out of fear for the rest of the week. But I pushed myself through it, and I only left when there were other people out on the sidewalk. I played the coming home game with the owl, or whatever it was. I ignored it every time that it appeared to turn into something and knock on my door. I made an attempt to tell my parents about it when they got back, but you can guess, being parents, what they thought. That I had an overactive imagination at 15 and 16, 
and that the shadows of the trees can create interesting illusions. The last thing has never come looking for me again, as far as I can tell. But I know what I saw for those seven days. I have no idea what it was or what it wanted. A few years back, my buddy and I went on a hunt. Neither of us were particularly looking forward to it. We didn't do this kind of thing for fun. In fact, the last time I'd even fired a gun had been in my teens, and that was an air rifle, and the targets were excitingly beer cans. However, my parents, living on an old farm, they didn't rely on it for income. They had some chickens and sheep, and something had been stealing and eating them. Time after time, they would come down in the morning to find a headless hen or mauled lamb, and neither of them were getting any younger, so to speak. My pops had an old rifle and had announced he was going to search for the coyote or wolf, or whatever was responsible for taking the animals, and clearly shoot it. Since Pop can't see too well, his hands are more shaky than Jello. I didn't think that was a good idea. So, that was pretty much how my buddy Jim and I ended up out in the woods behind the farm, at night, looking for some wolf or coyote. The kind of thing only hits you when you actually come across what you're looking for. Right up until we actually saw the wolf. We felt like boys again. And the second I saw those yellow eyes, I nearly crapped myself. Because simply, have you ever actually seen a wolf? They are huge. At least this one was. In fact, it was the biggest animal I have ever laid my eyes on. It wasn't too far away either, and it appeared to be stalking us, circling around us. It was on all fours, as a wolf should be, but this is going to sound strange. It didn't look entirely natural, like it wasn't 100% comfortable in that position. You might be wondering why we didn't just shoot it. I mean, that was why we were there, right? Well. This animal was causing my parents distress, killing their animals. It could easily attack them, and right at that moment, us. We both had guns, but right then, we also both felt something we could only describe as very evil and wrong, almost as if something was compelling us not to shoot. And if you think that is the most scary or crazy part, then listen up. The damned thing stood up on two legs and just casually walked away on two feet. We were too scared to shoot. Still, just standing there, guns pointed to the ground. We were entirely frozen, unable to pick it up and point it. After it had walked off, it was like a spell had been broken and we just were left standing there looking at each other in shock. I remember my friend saying, do you want to go after it? And me giving him a big no. We didn't know exactly what we had just seen, or why we hadn't been able to move. But whatever that thing was, I can tell you now, I'm nearly confident it wasn't anything natural. I believe it was ungodly, and not of this world. However, the only good thing to come from it was that it never came back again and, surprisingly, left my parents and their animals alone. Whether we broke some sort of curse, and yes, I know that sounds wacko, but I guess we won't never know. I ain't ever told anybody about it, because originally, who would believe me? Well, it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I befriended a Native American. I'm not trying to be racist here. I'm just saying. Somehow, through small talk, we got onto the discussion of this event that had happened, and he was surprised, told me I should have gotten blessed, and that I could have possibly been dealing with a skinwalker. Is this true? How accurate is he?
since I work as a delivery driver. It isn't unusual to see all types of wildlife and sometimes run into weird stuff. I can drive for many miles, hours, sometimes days at a time. I've been doing this for almost 20 years. But the strangest thing that's ever happened was when I was delivering down in Arizona. Before I go on, I want to preface this that I've seen some really, really crazy things. For example, a naked meth head running across the road at 2 in the morning. If that doesn't make your skin spike up, I don't know what will. Anyway, the scenery in Arizona is beautiful, and to keep the boredom at bay, I try and spot as many different animals as I can, specific to an area, so I could then tell my kids about them when I get home. So, when I was headed down this long, stereotypical dusty desert road, nothing on either side for as far as the eye could see, I was pleasantly surprised when this animal that looked kind of like a coyote suddenly seemed to appear out of nowhere. It appeared to be running alongside the truck like a pup might be chasing its owner. It must have been real fit because it followed me for several miles, never once losing speed. I began to feel a little unnerved by it. I couldn't have told you why exactly but something was gnawing at me internally. I didn't know too much about desert animals, coyotes especially, but it didn't seem normal that one could keep up with the vehicle for so long. So, I put my foot down and increased my speed. It stayed there, keeping pace, right outside the driver window. I put my foot to the floor, running the truck ragged. We must have hit 70 miles an hour, and that dang coyote was still there. I knew something weren't right. This creature wasn't right. Then, all of a sudden, it stopped. It was no longer following. And as I looked back in my mirror, through the trail of dust behind me, there wasn't a single coyote sat behind me in the road. It was a man. So I kept my foot on that pedal and didn't look back for a long time. He never seemed to reappear in man or coyote form, but I won't ever forget that. Turns out, people believe I saw a skinwalker or some sort of native shapeshifter. I'm not sure I believe it. I am active and part of a search and rescue volunteer team. We get to help out the police when someone goes missing and they need a lot of ground covered. We have found vital bits of evidence over the years, although thankfully, never an actual body. It does often involve us going deep into woods, as you might expect, which was where I saw this buck. Now, I have seen plenty of deer over the years. It's not unusual at all, and they have never caused me harm or threat. They usually just run away, as deer do, even the bucks. But this one was huge. Definitely an older male with huge antlers. Probably a five pointer. But it didn't run as soon as I saw it, or as soon as it saw me, which was strange. At first, I almost wondered if it might be hurt, too injured to get away. But I couldn't see anything. It wasn't acting injured if it was. Or if it was injured, it wasn't exactly obvious. Other than its apparent bravery or stupidity, there was just something so off-putting about the entire thing. Upon first glance, I couldn't place what it was. I was kind of in awe being that close to it, and it would have been a wonderful moment if there wasn't that overpowering sense of something just not being quite right. It just stared at me, and that was when I realized. It was its eyes. They were human. A pair of human eyes staring back at me from this large, unafraid buck. Now keep in mind, bucks are big, yes, but there's a certain size that they get up to, 
and this buck was just far too big to be an average buck. I've seen adult elks out in the wild, and they're massive. This buck easily rivaled that. It just continued to stare at me when the radio I had for communication came through with a message. Somebody had found bones. I looked up, and this buck was gone. No trace, as if it had never been there in the first place. Turns out, the bones were very old, and apparently belonged to an old tribe. I'm curious, and I'm coming to you for this. Was there spirit in that deer, or was this a skinwalker protecting the land? Possibly the spirit of an animal. It was scary, but it could have gone a lot worse. I'm just relieved as hell that I got called away, and never had the chance to find out for sure. This is among the many creepy things we encounter and deal with out in the wild. I'll never quite forget it. My husband and I grew up on a res. He has gotten the chance to tell me all sorts of amazing stories about legends and traditions of his ancestors. I always find them fascinating, even though to me, not having grown up with them, they just sound like entertaining stories. I mean, there's no way these things could possibly be real. At least I thought that for a while. Until we spent a week on the res last summer. We've stayed there dozens of times with various family members and friends before. But I have never experienced anything out of the ordinary. Until then, even though we do not share the same heritage, I am always respectful to my in-laws. My husband might know that I enjoy, but don't believe the stories. I would never openly admit that to the elders. My husband is also fairly distinctive. After getting ill a couple of years ago, he lost all his hair, so although he is only in his 30s, he is completely bald. When I saw him that week, coming out of the diner, when he had left him at the house not 10 minutes prior, I was rather bemused. I had the car. He was at home. Not only was he at home, well, his parents' home. He hadn't slept too well and was sat up in bed with a coffee still in his PJs when I left, only in the car to get a few supplies from the store. This man, who exited the diner, looked the exact image of my husband but was in jeans and a work jacket. By the time I looked back in the mirror, he was gone entirely. I even pulled over and called my husband. It took him a moment or two to answer, since his cell was in his pocket of his pants, which at the time were folded on the chair, in the bedroom, where he still was. I saw the man who looked identical, twice more during that same week each time my husband not being with me, but somewhere very different to where I saw the lookalike. Each time, by the time I was able to stop, he had disappeared. There is not one other male on the res anywhere near his age with a bald head. Of course, other people have come in and out. Other members of people's families, friends, deliveries, etc. But in a community as small as this, Everybody knows everybody, and everything that is going on. During the time I was seeing my not-husband, my actual husband continued to have problems sleeping, which he has nearly never suffered from. He was starting to feel really unwell, and that was when my in-laws brought in the medicine man. I wasn't exactly privy to the exact ritual, and I won't tell you anything I did see, because it is a sacred and special tradition. Whilst the man was with my husband and father-in-law, I sat in the kitchen with his mother, drinking tea, and she told me that the doppelganger I had been seeing in fact was a skinwalker, which was why my husband was sleeping and feeling so ill. The skinwalker was draining his life force, his very energy. They had to act and get rid of the curse. Otherwise, the skinwalker, apparently, could begin to control whoever they are copying. It was terrifying, 
and if I hadn't seen the man who looked identical to him, I would have never believed it. The ceremony took a long time, and apparently, the spell had been strong. We will never know why my husband was chosen. Thankfully, it appeared to work, and I insisted on driving around the res as he got rested. Thank God I didn't see the man who looked like him again. Hopefully, that is my only and last encounter with one of these beings. I was riding my bike along a paved trail here in Montana, a downhill one, no less. It was walled in by pines, and the scent of cold air against my face was literally intoxicating. I can only describe it somewhat accurately, because if you're not a bike rider, well, it's hard to explain. This was the healthiest I'd ever felt when I was on the trail. Fresh air is like a drug. But the polarity of everything changed one evening when I was out for another ride, trying to get my fix before I had to call it a day to start another grueling work week. You see, bike rides have always been a huge thing for me. In fact, it's really my only escape. While others turn to alcohol, drugs, and very toxic habits, I try and do things that boost my body. So, I was coasting down the trail when a black bear appeared out of nowhere and even began running alongside me. I nearly wiped out, unsure of what to do with the bizarrety of the situation. If it wanted to, it could have pounced on me, but it didn't even look at me. It seemed to be focused on the downhill descent as much as I had been. I pedaled and pedaled to gain distance. That was when another shape came out of the trees that was much, much larger than the bear. It tackled the bear to the ground with a force unlike anything I'd ever seen. No, I was not drunk on adrenaline. In this moment, I thought that I saw whatever attacked the bear looked like the largest wolf I'd ever seen. I'm talking about a creature of titanic size. It grabbed the bear yanked it by the neck, and stood up on its hind legs. The bear seemed to be yelping and grasping for life. It was terrifying. I watched this all from the shock of being on my bike, which meant I literally wasn't watching where I was going. I slid off the trail, wiped out, and eventually lost consciousness. I woke up. The picture of that monstrous wolf kept flashing in the back of my mind. That thing grabbed that black bear like it was a loose cub running away. It terrified me. I didn't know why it didn't go after me. I've tried going back on the trail since, but it's not the same anymore. I don't feel like I can relax like I used to. The anxiety of what might jump out of the woods overshadows all else. And much to my dismay, it's the same with the other trails. I'll never be able to experience the outdoors the same way again, unfortunately. Thanks for hearing me out. We lived on a big property when I was younger, and my mom is obsessed with rabbits. Sometimes, some of the local animals come to pay a visit, and although they cannot get to the rabbits, because they only have little hearts, they get scared to death. Literally, Rabbits can have a heart attack and die right of fear. Anyway, my dad decided to set up some traps. Whatever was getting in was managing to climb the fence, so he was hoping the traps laid out would work. I have no idea what they thought the culprit might be. Some deranged bunny killer animal, maybe. Anyway, even though my mom loves her rabbits, she decided it was too gross to have to go and check the traps. She offered me an extra allowance if I went. So, every morning I checked and there was nothing. All the bunnies were fine. They began to suspect that whatever was bothering them somehow was intelligent enough to see the traps and run away. Coyotes, maybe? Not sure. That is, until one night... 
I heard this howl, followed by what sounded like a scream. I wasn't going out there to check, but I was willing to bet there would be some sort of wolf or coyote in the trap in the morning. It was the only thing I could think of that would make that sort of noise. I told my mom that I'd heard something, and she insisted I take the shotgun with me in case. Now, you're probably wondering where my dad is in all of this. Overseas is the answer. I'm a military brat, so I also knew my way around a shotgun. I head out to the trap, and I knew it. There was something in it. It looked like a coyote, but much bigger. And there is something not quite right, but I couldn't decide what it is. I should have just shot it right then and there, right in the head. But I was entranced in fear and curiosity. This large, not quite a coyote. It was alive. Its back leg was caught in the trap. It was bleeding bad, but it wasn't showing any bone, so the trap had acted more like a handcuff, so to speak, a very tight one. Keeping it there, rather than like a bear trap, where it rips deep into the skin. Every single bit of common sense told me this was the douche that had been upsetting my mother by scaring her rabbits. That's all I needed to do was shoot it, like I had done to other animals. But I had this innate feeling in me that was telling me not to do it. I decided to take a quick walk around the full perimeter. Maybe I was trying to gear myself up for the inevitable. And then, when I get back to the trap, it was completely empty. Quickly, I scan the fields and woodland around, and just in the distance, I can see that large coyote limping, but walking on two legs. Walking or limping on two feet like an injured person who had been shot in the leg. I stood there staring at it until it disappeared into those woods. I told my mom that I had found a dead coyote and that I would buried it even though it was a lie. She believed me, and her rabbits after that were unbothered. That coyote thing that walked like a man never came back. That memory always sticks out to me, because as bizarre as the wild is, I've never quite encountered or heard of anything like that since then. I was out fishing with my father, he was older and his sight was going, but he still had a love for going out on the lake. I knew better than to pass up any chance to be with my dad at this stage in his life. We pushed out onto a quiet lake and passed the time in quiet and hushed conversation. I did catch a few catfish within the first couple hours, and they were just the right size. It was the catch my dad got that would have us talking for a long time. It crested the waters a couple of times, and it was a bass that looked like it could have fed the two of us for three days. A real beauty of a catch. My dad wasn't able to reel it on his own, so I helped out in whatever awkward giddy way I could. We were winning, though, amongst the splashes getting closer, and as most fish stories go, the line snapped at the last minute, but this was strangely accompanied by a very large splash that even a very large fish could not make. We were just as puzzled as we were disappointed. My dad doesn't like to go cheap when it comes to fishing equipment. There's no go reason why that fish should have been able to snap the line. We gazed around at the shore and contemplated going landside for a while with our fish. Our thoughts were then interrupted when something huge emerged from the water, angering the wriggling fish in place with its long hand. It struck me as a gigantic dog, but it was walking on its hind legs, almost naturally, as if that were the very thing it had been doing since birth. It shook itself and continued on swimming. The mustiness and the smell of wet dog drifted across the water to us and there it sat on shore, on its haunches, and tore into this fish. It slowly leered over at us more than once, 
and the eyes I swear were glowing, like a cat's eyes when the light catches them just right. My dad and I should have panicked and gotten out of there, but we were so shocked. We just laid there, low in the boat, watching this overgrown demon dog guzzle down his prized catch. The teeth tore into this fish like soft ice cream. They were long fangs, ridiculously oversized. Its ears were also long and curved, giving the impression of almost sleek black horns. When it had picked off every last bit of meat within seconds, it appeared to lick its hands quickly and bound off inland out of our sight. My dad and I just looked at each other, complete disbelief. We wore the same expression. We both had seen how unbelievable that fish had been. We both had seen how unbelievable that wolf monster had been. And we both knew that no matter what or whoever we told, nobody was going to ever take us seriously. I discovered your podcast about a month later, and I told my father about it. He figured it was a good place to tell our tale, as any. So, I'm telling you what is probably the most outlandish story of the one that got away, unlike you've ever heard. I'll make sure my dad hears it if you read it. I've been enjoying listening to your program ever since I discovered it. It feels like a safe place to share these stories without ever being judged or being ridiculed. Keep up the good work. And as a quick side note before I conclude, I was beginning to really think that werewolves were real until I discovered there was such an animal called a dogman that I believe that is what we saw that day. Anyway... Thank you. Sometimes, when you're in the car and you have to go on a long drive and it's nighttime, when you have to go, you have to go. If there isn't an official service station around and it's a dark country road and nobody else is around anyway, especially if you are a bloke, you can do this. I'm not proud, but needs must. And this happened just weeks ago. I was busting, and it was at least about 30 minutes home, and I was not going to make it. So, since I haven't seen another car for miles, and I'm in the middle of bloody nowhere, I pull over and keep the engine running and the lights on to give me a bit of sight, since it is pitch black. I'm finishing up, when I began to hear a crunching sound from the tree line behind me. It made me jump enough to get my shoes a bit wet, which was bad enough. But I also recall thinking, really, a nosy badger or something like that had come to see what was happening right at that moment. I was still tidying myself up when I now hear a further noise. This time it was a good thing that I had already relieved myself. I heard a growl. I am no expert at all on nocturnal animal behavior, but I was now pretty certain this was not a badger. For just a moment, I was frozen, my brain telling me to get in the car. My legs were just let's play stick in the mud. And then he appeared, just walked out of the tree line and onto the grass in front. At very first glance, I panicked. I thought it was a werewolf in the flesh, and I was a goner. But I was alive, and I looked again. It looked more like a dog. I know it sounds ludicrous, but it was a man's body with a dog's head. Vicious looking, but more human than werewolf-like. Tall, covered with very dark hair, and also very slender. Then he growled at me again. My legs almost became unglued, and I piled myself back in the car and drove out of there quickly. For some reason, even though this creature appeared hostile, it never made an attempt at me or my life or to get me in my car. It's like it respected the fact that I got in my car and drove off. Maybe it was trying to scare me away this entire time. I'm just glad it didn't appear to follow me but I sure as hell did not look back or stop until I get home. For reference, 